Hello, this is Dinosu. I recently took a trip to Acadia National Park in Maine, USA, and saw stunning views of mountains, cliffs, and colorful autumn trees. While hiking up the shady mountainside trails, looking over the canopy of trees to the mountains and valleys with rivers feeding into clear blue ponds, I paused for a moment and thought to myself, I wonder if I can use Perlin noise to procedurally generate terrain resembling these views. Probably not something the other hikers were thinking that day, but I was excited to go home and give it a try. In this tutorial, I will showcase a Scratch project, but if you are interested in a different programming language or just interested in the math, this tutorial is still for you. You may have seen my new project on Scratch called Autumn in Acadia, in which you generate unlimited scenes that simulate autumn views in Acadia National Park. When pressing the flag, the program displays an unusual blurry map in grayscale and then gives you the option to render it in 3D. When you press render in 3D, a realistic scene is randomly generated with water and mountains with rocky areas and colorful trees. But how can it generate a different realistic scene with every run? And what is this unusual blurry map? This project is based on a technique you might have heard of, an algorithm called Perlin noise. In this video, I will go over the Perlin noise algorithm in detail, and then explain how I used it to generate a landscape. Specifically, I will discuss the algorithm for 2D Perlin noise, explain how it can be used to shape terrain, and then describe a method I discovered that adds features such as rocks. Perlin noise is an algorithm devised by Ken Perlin in 1983 to generate noise that is always perfectly smooth. First of all, let's define noise. I'm not referring to a sound, I'm referring to a collection of values that are randomized in some way. Take a look at this picture. If whiter pixels represent the higher points in a landscape, and darker pixels represent the lower points, do you think this would make a very good terrain? Let's see. Yeah, not the best. The picture I showed you was simply a collection of randomly shaded pixels. A picture where each pixel represents a different height is called a height map. The picture I referred to as an unusual blurry map in the beginning of the video was actually a height map. What about this height map though? Let's see it. Okay, that's decent. It has smooth transitions between the high points and low points, just like in the real world. You are probably still skeptical, though. It's not very interesting, is it? In fact, it looks too smooth and predictable. Before I explain how to enhance this terrain, I want to first clarify something. If a pixel in the map is completely white, it represents a Perlin noise value of the square root of 2 over 2. If a pixel is completely black, it represents a value of the negative square root of 2 over 2. These specific values seem arbitrary, but it is important to understand that height map pixels are associated with numerical values. Suppose we have these two maps. We can add them together by adding each pixel in the first map to the corresponding pixel in the second map. So what does happen if we add them together? Let's see. As you may have expected, it forms a slightly more detailed version of the originally smooth map. I find it very cool that you can still see the base shape from the first map in the summed image. Let's see something like this in 3D. Wow, do you see how in addition to the smooth base, there are also smaller bumps? This is because the first map is made of just a few wide tall bumps, and the second map is made of many small short bumps. And this is how the general shape of the terrain in Autumn in Acadia is made. In my project, there are three layers of Perlin noise added together. The widest one has a width factor of 150. In my project, this means that 150 squared Perlin noise calculations are made inside each grid square of this first layer. We'll cover grid squares later. For comparison, the second layer has a width factor of 100. The third has a width factor of 30, which is five times the bumpiness of the first one. Additionally, the layers get less tall as they get less wide. The height of the second layer is multiplied by 0.2 before being added to the layer sum, and the height of the third layer is multiplied by 0.1. 
This creates the blurry height map I showed you earlier, which is perfect for terrain generation. Okay, so Perlin noise is just what we need. How can you do it yourself? I will describe the procedure for creating a single layer of Perlin noise, because after you know that, you'll be able to add the layers together. The randomness of Perlin noise comes from the use of many vectors pointing in random directions. The first step in creating Perlin noise is defining a grid of random unit vectors. What do I mean by this? If you don't know what a vector is, just think of it as a line segment with a direction. A unit vector is a vector that has a magnitude, or length, of 1. A grid of these vectors simply refers to a grid with a unit vector at each grid intersection. These vectors are called gradient vectors. Let's add some numbers to this grid. You can think of it as a coordinate plane. Now, say we want to find the value of the Perlin noise layer at the point 0 0.75, 0 0.25. The first step is to identify all the corners of the vector grid that surround the target point. In this case, they are 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 0. The second step is to find the vectors that start from the surrounding corners and point to the pixel in focus. To do this, find the difference between the target pixel coordinates from the x and y positions of the surrounding grid coordinates, like this. I do not believe these vectors have a name, but in this video I'll call them distance vectors. The third step is to find the dot products between the distance vectors and the corresponding gradient vectors. Finding the dot product of two vectors is very easy. Just add the product of the x components and the y components. For this corner, this is the corresponding dot product between the gradient vector and distance vector. The final step is to interpolate between these dot products to get a single value. You may have seen my video about my project Drawing Morpher, in which I explain how to use linear interpolation to morph two drawings. Here I'll briefly explain linear interpolation. Given a start value and an end value to interpolate, we can find the value at any fraction between them. This fraction is usually represented by a variable called t. For example, interpolating between 2 and 4 with a t value of 0 0.5 would be 3, because 3 is 0 0.5 of the way between 2 and 4. Interpolating between 2 and 4 with a t value of 0 0.75 would be 3.5, because 3.5 is 0 0.75 of the way between 2 and 4. This is the expression you can use to lerp or linear interpolate two values for any time variable t. Notice how as the value of t increases at a constant rate, the interpolated value increases at a constant rate too. Now, what happens if we apply a function to t before using it in the linear interpolation? Take the function f of x equals 6x to the 5th minus 15x to the 4th plus 10x cubed. The very important thing to note here is that when a value from 0 to 1 is the input, a value from 0 to 1 is always the output, but the function is smoother than the line from earlier. That is why this function is the standard for Perlin noise. Great, so we have a smoother way to interpolate between numbers. If we want to interpolate between a and b at time point x, then we interpolate between a and b linearly with t equals 6x to the 5th minus 15x to the 4th plus 10x cubed. Watch how the interpolated value changes at different rates depending on the value of t. Now to apply this interpolation to the four dot products we got earlier. The first step in determining a single value from these dot products is to interpolate the top two values. The value of t will be the distance from the x value of the top left corner to the x value of the target point. That sounded confusing, but just pause the video and look at this visual. Then do the same thing on the bottom. Can you guess what's next? To get our final value of our Perlin noise at this point, Interpolate the bottom and top interpolated values with t equals the distance from the y value of the point to the y value of the bottom left corner. That's it. 
you now know how to get the Perlin noise value for a given point in space. At this point, you can recreate the height map at the beginning of the project by following the previous procedure on every pixel in the map. Remember to use multiple layers for the best effect. To make a layer bumpier, simply increase the width of each vector grid square. Now, I'll explain how to use what you already know to add water, trees, and exposed rocky areas to a render, inspired by the ones I saw in Acadia. Water is the easiest to explain. If the Perlin noise value at a given point is below a certain level, it is assigned to water instead of land. In the project, any areas with a noise value below zero are drawn as water at a height of zero. This is effectively taking the maximum between the noise value and zero. The rocky parts that line the shore and resemble the rocky shores of Acadia are generated using a similar method to the water. If the value of the height map at a pixel is just a bit greater than the height of the water, it is used as rocks along the shore. In the case of my project, the boundary is 0 0.025. We're almost there. Can you guess how the rocky parts that aren't along the shore are generated? Maybe you guessed it. It's a similar method to the water. An additional layer of Perlin noise is created, not to add to the height map, but to sample for every pixel to determine if a pixel is supposed to be rocky. If the noise value for this layer is greater than a certain value, then it is used as rock. In my project, this threshold is 0 0.25. Every pixel in the scene that is not covered by water or rocks is covered by a randomly colored tree that represents Acadia's fall foliage. And that's it. You now know exactly how the terrain in Autumn and Acadia is shaped and colored. If you have any questions, reach out to me in the comments below or on my Scratch profile. Thank you for watching.